Um, in the last uh, PowerPoint, I have discussed the definition of religious pluralism and I promise that uh, we are going to talk about the causes of religious pluralism, what makes uh, this philosophy emerge in the Western Christian context. And if you look at the slides, you will find that I'm trying to give you uh, some background, you know, a very quick glance of the background behind this philosophy. Mm, and I'm taking this from the internet, definitely. So um, this is taken from other, you know, the pictures are taken from other sources. So I should give credit to that sources as well. Uh, so you can see there uh, the, the the top left on the top left of the slide yeah, it reads extra ecclesiam nulla salus uh, I believe uh, some of you may have uh, recalled this term before maybe some of you have already um, uh, memorized this term extra ecclesiam nulla salus and if you notice that um, Underneath it, uh, there's a term that resembles the word coexist, and there's a big cross on the coexist here. Yeah? And then you find, you know, the picture of Jesus that is just to make this like more interesting to all of you. Though we know for sure this is not the real Jesus, no one has seen him. All right. And then you find there, which is also very significant to what we are going to discuss today, citation from the Bible, John chapter 14, verse 6, yeah, uh, in which uh, Jesus was uh, recorded to have uh, convincing someone about his path, about his message, about his teaching. So Jesus was said to uh, claim to this person, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So this is very famous uh, citation with regard to uh, Christianity as the path to salvation. Alright, now let's take a look at why... Um, I am bringing you to this discussion uh, and how this is captured in the outline yeah so I divided that uh, the reasons for uh, the emergence of uh, religious pluralism as a philosophy uh, related too much to two uh, major reasons one being the internal reason secondly being the external reason so you have sub items under these two major reasons so you find that the internal reasons here referring to the problems within christianity or to the context uh, the internal context of christianity sometimes i use the word theological reason uh, internal reason theological reason that uh, brought about the need to uh, formulate religious pluralism and the other reason is external reason uh, and there are a number well at least I mentioned here uh, two uh, reasons being external reasons to the emergence of this philosophy so let's take a look at the internal reason you find that the internal reason here they are one two three 
for the first part being or the first reason being the problems of religious truth claim if you can still remember in the last um, meeting in the last uh, slides or powerpoint i have mentioned about um, truth claim in religions and i mentioned about there are many truth claims in religion so um from the perspective of Christianity, is diverse truth claim or conflicting truth claim has become an internal problem to them. Yeah. Uh, and secondly, why that has become internal problem? Because Christianity has a very, um, I would say, exclusive, a very exclusive concept, idea of salvation that makes it uh, impossible to tolerate um, other religious truth claim and thirdly because he, you can find that Christianity has a very entering history yeah very interesting history and that history uh, has largely contributed to the emergence of religious pluralism and finally the well, not only the perceptions, but the way Christianity present herself in the past as well as today until the emergence of religious pluralism has been very much exclusive. And that has, uh, you know, um, inspired some scholars to re-examine this position. All right. Now, with regard to social, uh, with regard to external reason, we found that the, you know, the world phenomenon, the global phenomenon, became one of the major external reasons that uh, encourage or that uh, make it possible for religious pluralism to make it way. Uh, at the current time and the other external reason uh, being the development in the scientific study of religion that has also uh, contributed to the uh, acceptance to religious pluralism okay now uh, to be able to understand the development of religious pluralism we have no other choice but to go back to history now um, going back to history i would say um, it is essential for uh, us to go back to as well as early as uh, 325 ce yeah 325 ce the nicene council yeah the nicene council uh they called um well before that before that yeah before that i think um before the uh, nicene council uh we want to find what actually has um, triggered this and before before the nicene not before the nicene council after the nicene council so the, the incident during uh, this council uh, actually uh, is a repercussion or a response against uh, the Nicene Council. So I'm sorry, this is what I actually mean. So we go back to the Second Vatican Council in 1965, of which this council has responded to what have been decided or determined in the Nicene Council in three. 5 CE. So you see, the Second Vatican Council took place in 1965, where the Christian, uh, especially uh, the Catholic in this context, accurately speaking, reviewed their position earlier in 3 to 5 CE. That, that was a very long time, you see. From 1965, they were reviewing their position in three to five CE. So what was the issue reviewed by the Second Vatican Council? Uh, the issue reviewed uh, the Vatican Council is the question of salvation. 
yeah, the question of salvation and this review the idea of salvation is documented in a very famous document called Nusra Atete. Uh, Nusra Atete is a document that explains the relationship between the church, the Catholic church in this regard, to the non-Christians, yeah, to the non-Christian religion. So, um, why was uh, the Second Vatican Council excited or you know, move to review the idea of salvation. What was the idea of salvation before the uh, Vatican Council? Yeah. So you see the point down there. Uh, it says that the Vatican Council started to review the idea of uniqueness of Christianity. Now, what were among the idea? What were among the teaching of Christians that propagate the idea of Christianity? Yeah, I put two dominant uh, denomination within Christianity and the uh, idea reviewed uh, about salvation in these two denomination, yeah, Catholicism as well as Protestantism. So Catholicism uh, is known for its uh, very famous tagline, the one that you have seen earlier, Extra Ecclesiam Nulla Salus, which means no salvation outside the church. So the Catholic Church in 325 CE uh, established that no one will find salvation except if they accept Catholicism. Now, if you don't accept Catholicism, you, you will not go to heaven. I mean, strictly speaking, you will not go to heaven. You will be damned. Yeah, God does not help you. If you want to be helped, you have to be in Catholicism. Then only you can be saved. Yeah. Say from why? Uh, okay, for this, then we need to go back to a little bit of history of Christianity. Say from what? Say from the original sin. What was the original sin? The sin of Adam and Eve for the is disobeying God when they were in heaven. They have taken the fruit of knowledge without the permission of God. Uh, in which earlier God has reminded them not to take the fruits, but because of their forgetfulness, uh, the way Bible recorded it, because they were tempted by Satan, so uh, they both of them have taken the fruit of knowledge, and because of the the uh, the consumption of the fruit. Uh, they were discarded, they were expelled from the heaven. And, you know, this was the first sin of man. That's why it is called original sin. Yeah. So man was expelled from heaven because of this terrible mistake. Now, Jesus um, was, the Christians believed that Jesus was sent to the earth to save man from this original sin. How did he save man from this original sin? By sacrificing himself. So when he um, when he um, accomplished the will of God. What was the will of God? The will of God for him to be crucified. Uh, that was the will of God. He was sent as messenger and then he was supposed to be crucified. That was the will of God. Why God will as such? Because God want him, Jesus, to be redeemer. Someone that redeemed the original sin of man. And for man who wanted to be recognized uh, as saved, he has to acknowledge that Jesus Christ died on the cross. 
and you know uh, this is quite interesting in Christianity yeah you if you do not recognize him being crucified then you do not believe in Christianity because necessarily Christianity uh, necessity that you believe in Jesus not only that you believe in Jesus and his message but you also believe in the whole story about him uh, being uh, caught by the Roman soldiers being crucified and uh, being uh, ascended to the heaven and resurrected and incarnated as God. Only if you believe in the sequence of doctrines, then you will be saved. And who taught this doctrine of salvation? The one that taught this doctrine of salvation uh, in Catholic uh, context is the church. As in Catholicism, um, the body that pronounce uh, the um, legalism the legalistic idea or teaching or the legal body in Catholicism is the church yeah so you cannot find salvation outside the church you cannot find salvation outside Catholicism or Christianity Christian Catholic in that sense yeah and then you have another uh, denom denomination which is Protestantism. Protestantism talks about five solas okay, uh, in comparison to the Catholic Church. For if you study uh, Christianity, then you uh, will be, I believe that you have encountered this uh, story of denomination of clash between Catholicism and Protestantism. Protestantism emerged later in the history of Christianity when the Catholic claimed that they emerged as early as uh, 325 CE officially when they became the uh, official religion of the Greco Roman Empire. But Protestantism emerged very late in history. Uh, approximately in 1600 uh, CE you know so it's like uh, 1500 years after the establishment of the Catholic Church Protestantism image yeah so why protest why it is called Protestant because it protested against the Catholic Church. Uh, it is understandable why uh, they did not follow this extra ecclesia omnila salus uh, as a doctrine. They have their own doctrine to propagate the uh, Christianity as a as the only religion of salvation, and they they are five uh, five. Uh, principles here yeah? what are those principles first is sola fide faith alone which means that if you have faith in jesus christ you are saved uh, sola fide sola gratia grace alone yeah if you become a christian no no you become a christian by the grace of god alone yeah so, uh, by the grace of God, you will be saved. It is by His grace that you become Christian. And if you have His grace, His mercy, then you are saved. And then, sola scriptura. Uh, scripture alone means that um, if you want to find salvation, you find it through the scripture, which is the Bible. So you need to read the Bible, understand the Bible, interpret the Bible as best as possible on your own, and you will find your salvation. And then Solus Christus. Yeah, what is Solus Christus? Means Christ alone. If you want to find salvation, you have to believe in Christ. Only Christ. Yeah. Um, so um, that is enough for you to
to warranty that you will get salvation. And finally, soli dio gloria, which means that the glory of, of God. If you believe in Jesus Christ resurrected, ascended to the heaven, incarnated, and he become God, so you will attain salvation. Hence, the citation that we have seen in the earlier slides. Yeah? No one comes to the Father except through me. So, what I'm, I've tried to show you in this slide is the two bigger or dominant denomination in Christianity, yeah, which are Catholicism and Protestantism, believe in uh, the fact that salvation can only be found in Christianity. You know, Christianity. Catholicism as well as Protestantism. Hence, Christianity is unique because it is the only religion that promised salvation. And interestingly, the Second Vatican Council of the Catholic Church uh, examined this uh, idea of um, salvation can only be found in uh, Christianity in Catholicism. Okay, so you find that in the course of Christian history for about 1,500 years, the Catholics, yeah, the Catholics, the Protestants have been living in a very exclusive manner. They believe that salvation cannot be attained by people of other religions. Now, Catholicism is very much known of this exclusive attitude because if you look into the history, when Christianity became the, or Catholicism become, became the uh, official religion of the Greco-Roman Empire, so um, the Pope of the Empire uh, were uh, propagating this idea of exclusiveness of Christianity. As you can see, for example, um, the, uh, what you call that, the king, sorry, uh, this is uh, Augustine, it's not the king, the theologian, very famous theologian of Christianity, of Catholicism, Saint Augustine, uh, this uh, during the 4th century, you know, 400, uh, 500 BC, early 500 BCE, and then he he was influenced by the Emperor Theodosius, yeah, who persuaded him to formulate a, a doctrine that makes it impossible for people within the Greco-Roman empires to worship other than the Christianity or Christ. Yeah, that happened during the 400. Uh, CE. All right. So, um, you see, when Catholicism or Christianity became the official religion of the Greco-Roman Empire, it has become a very dominant religion, and uh, there is some kind of imposition to the belief system of the people. I mean, people were not allowed to believe in religions other than Catholicism. Yeah. Um, you know, what makes uh, the Catholics uh, become so powerful at that point of time was because of this. As I mentioned earlier, the church become very powerful, become the source of uh, uh, legitimate power. Uh, and many of the state ideologies were bred by the, by the church. Yeah? The same goes to this idea of exclusiveness, exclusivism, idea of salvation found in Catholicism. Yeah. These were actually developed uh, during uh, the early time of Catholicism and as it has become a state ideology, which means that you cannot reject this ideology because it is state's ideology. You know, if you reject this ideology, it it means that you are against the state. As a matter of fact, there was a study about one man, one theologian by the name of Saint Arius. So Saint Arius, uh, 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 Saint Arius uh, rejected one of the 
uh, doctrines formulated by the church yeah, that was the doctrine about uh, Jesus Christ as God when he was uh, sent to the earth because he believed that Jesus Christ was a prophet he was a messenger when he was sent to this earth only after he was crucified uh, resurrected, ascended to the heaven and become incarnated that he became God. But when he was firstly sent to the world, he was a prophet. He was a man. He wasn't God. But uh, the Catholic Church wanted to stress that Jesus Christ, when he was sent to the earth, he was half man and half God. Alright? So what happened to Arius? Arius was killed because he was seen as challenging the state ideology, you know. So he was killed, his disciples were killed, and it, he was regarded as heretical. Yeah, heretical. Okay, now what makes uh, the Catholics, okay, let me speak of the Catholics because during this period 3 to 5 CE until 16,000, the emergence of Protestantism, even with the existence of Orthodox Church during, the, during 1,100 CE, but Catholicism remained a very dominant uh, Christian. Yeah? So in the 16th century, the Catholic... Uh, uh, was moved by the colonial power, you know, of Portuguese, of Spain, of um, French. Yeah. They were moved to um, explore the world. You know, if the colonial explored the world to find wealth in other parts of the world, the church sent uh, delegations with the colonial power for what purpose? For evangelization, for missionary. So you find all these names, Henry Navigator, Christopher Columbus, Vasco da Gama, Ferdinand Magellan, Francis Drake, and then to this part of the Alfonso de Albuquerque. Yeah? Who were these people? They were actually mm, missionary. They came to this part of the world and brought together with them Catholic missionary to disseminate Christianity outside uh, the Greek, the Western Rome Empire. By 615, 16th century, there was no longer, you know, Roman Empire as such because every state under the Roman Empire has become an independent country. That's therefore you find what we learn in history, you know, Portuguese, uh, French, and then Spain, because all these countries under the Roman Empire, you know, throughout the time, they managed to liberate themselves from the empire and establish their own state, ruled by different um, ruler or leader, but then remain united under one particular church, which was the Catholic Church. So you can imagine how chaotic the situation was because there were so many other countries with different rulers but one particular church that regulated all these different states or countries. Yeah. Okay, um, so um, the literature is recorded that actually when the colonial power went to this part of the world, especially Asia, they were coming with missionaries. Now, why were they sending missionaries to this part of the world? Because they want to uh, help this part of the world to find salvation, yeah, which is by becoming Christianity. Okay, except that... Um, you know, after a very long time of missionary activities, but it is quite sad to learn that uh, according to Paul F. Nietzsche in his book titled No Other Name, uh, missionary activities failed. Missionary activities overseas yeah, failed. And this has made the Christians, the Catholics especially, the Protestants later on followed suit. Uh, this has made them... Uh, thinking and wanted to understand, to study why after much effort done but 
Christianity still failed to convince people of other religions. Yeah. So therefore, the Second Vatican Council started to review its position, especially after a very long period of time. They have started to get to know people all over the world. Like you know, the Catholic went to Malacca, went to China, went to Japan, went to Philippines. The same goes to the Philippines. They went to Jap uh, They went to Philipp. Sorry, the same goes to the. Spain, Spain, Spain yeah? so the Spanish went to Philippines and converted the people there and you know the Dutch I forgot to mention the Dutch in the 17th century went to Indonesia and a lot of missionary activities in Indonesia um, so um, you see the 1965 the Catholic Church started to review its position and actually this was moved by uh, uh, German theologian by the name of Karl Rahner. Karl Rahner was the one who motivated the Catholic Church to review its position. Why? Because Karl Rahner started to notice that there are many good believers apart from Christianity. Yeah? And he coined this term, uh, he called it uh, anonymous Christian. What anonymous Christian mean? Anonymous Christians refers to the non-Christians outside Christianity who can be called as Christian without a name. Why? Because they were good people except that they have yet to know or to be preached uh, uh, with the teaching of Christianity. So these were good people and they were known as anonymous Christians. Okay, now, um, why uh, what Rana did was significant to the Christians? Because it was for the first time that the Christians, the Catholics to be accurately speaking, uh, make some rooms for people of other religions. Uh, in God's plan of salvation. Before this, you know, they were very exclusive, right? The Christians, the Catholics were very exclusive. Whoever are not Catholics, whoever not, are not Christians, they cannot be saved. But, the Second Vatican Council started to acknowledge that they are uh, religions who teach men to be good. If you still recall the word religious inclusivism that I have discussed in the earlier slides, this is it, what uh, uh, Nostra Atete is propagating. The position of religious inclusivism and therefore you find the Nostra Atete uh, quoted from the Bible stating the common element that binds men of different religions together you know it says we are all created by god and that our final goal is the same since god wants to save all uh, before i used to believe that god only saved christianity or the christians but this time they were opening it a little bit more making christianity more inclusive by saying that god wants to send save everybody in this world so they started to acknowledge religions like hinduism and buddhism because you know these two religions also teach good values and the church did not have anything against the good values now with regard to the catholic church relationship to, to islam this has also been mentioned or addressed specifically in the Nostra Atete because for the first time the Christians or the Catholic acknowledge that they are teachings within Islam that bind Islam with Christianity. Those were about the belief in God, belief in Abraham, Mary, Jesus, yeah, and uh, the you know the the same ideas about ethics yeah? about values yeah? social justice moral values peace and freedom have made christianity and islam um binds together 
All right, but they were also Paul F. Nature believe in this, you know, uh, thing that to him, the reason why Nostra Aetete was formulated because the Catholic feel very guilty about what has happened to the Jews in German. Maybe you know about the uh, tragedy of Holocaust where many Jews were killed by Hitler. Uh, interesting, it is interesting to note that German uh, has many theologians. It has, uh, you know, breed, it is a, it has breed many uh, Catholic theologians. But when Hitler killed the Jews, none of the Christian theologians said anything to stop that genocide from happening. So there was a guilty feeling. Um, from among the Catholic Church. I mentioned to you just now, Karana, a German theologian. So most probably this what has actually moved him. Yeah. Or of course some other elements too. But according to Paul F. Nitzel, one of the reasons was this genocide of the Jews that made the Catholic review its position towards other religion. Yeah. So, um, and of course, there were also political uh, ramifications, conflicts within the church and the king and the ruler of the country. Yeah? Uh, and there was a, a tendency to balance the influence of the church as well as the influence of the state. So... There was, you know, a kind of uh, effort to balance this power struggle between the state and the church. So you see, uh, just now I explained to you the, uh, the what do you call that, the internal reason. Those were uh, the situations taking place within Catholicism. Yeah, that has brought about this for the first time in history changes from exclusivism to inclusivism. All right, now external reason. With regard to external reason, then um, you find that this is very much referring to the development in the study of religion. Uh, perhaps you have heard uh, uh, one Western scholar of religion by the name of um, Frederick Max Muller. Frederick Max Muller was claimed as the father of comparative religion. Okay, so what about him? He has uh, made people, uh, you know, scholars started to have interest in the study of religion. Why? Because he introduced a scientific method in the study of religion. Uh, before Muller, uh, the Christians or men study religion uh, using theology, by means of theology. So therefore, uh, in Christianity, you have that Christian theology of other religions. But with Muller, he introduced the idea that now we can study religion, but we need not to uh, use theology, we can study religion scientifically by means of other sciences. For example, you can study uh, religion using philology, uh, you know, which is linguistic approach. We can also study religion using sociology, using politics, using economy, using psychology. Yeah? So, and these have been regarded as um, scientific methods. You must also acknowledge that during this period, you know, 16th, 17th century was a period of enlightenment. Yeah? Enlightenment whereby um, Western scholars who were originally Christians started to acknowledge the role of reasoning in helping men to discover a lot of things. You know, before that, uh, theology, theology have been a very dominant science or subject to the Western context. But once when they figure out, well, actually, this small thing on top of your head, 
uh, have a lot to guide you to understand the world phenomenon. Uh, you can find answers using your own logical reasoning, uh, using your empirical observations, experience. You need not to be so much caught up with what the Bible says about the world, about phenomenon. You know, so people started to study religion using different um, uh, means, not only theology. So Max Muller, you know, I go back to Max Muller. Max Muller was interesting because uh, he studied Hinduism. That was for the first time for the Christians to study religions other than Christianity. Maybe before that. Uh, by means of theology, Christians studied Islam. Maybe they studied Judaism because they need to uh, engage with these two religions and challenge these two religions. But Max Miller were not interested to study these two <laughs> rival religions to Christianity. He, he thought it was enough. He studied Hinduism because he was, was impressed with Hinduism. He stayed in India for uh, quite some time and he familiarized himself with Hinduism. You can imagine, you know, Christianity or Catholic, Catholic, Catholicism being, you know, monotheistic religion. And for someone who understands uh, Hinduism as monistic religion as well as pluralistic religion, practice monism as a system of belief and also can consolidate politism. Wow, this is very interesting to study. So, Max Miller studied Hinduism by studying the language of the Hindus through its scripture, the Rig Veda. Yeah, so this is one, one approaches that have opened up, yeah, opened up for a number of approaches in the study of Vedas. You know, so, you know, people, Christians started to learn about other regions, not only Islam, not only Judaism, but also Hinduism, and later on people studied Buddhism, yeah? studied pagan religions, never that the Christians were so interested to study pagan religions, but they studied pagan religions, you can see in the work of Emily Durkheim and Mercia Iliadi, for example, they studied the myth of this uh, uh, South American religion, the myth of the Mexican, the myth of the uh, what else, the Aztec community, the myth of the Maya community, and many more. Yeah. So you know what has made the scholars, the Western scholars, uh, because of this uh, interest in this in other religions, was this awareness that. Right? Well, there are many other religions in this world. And they sort of noticed that, well, these people are good. These people believe in God. These people teach good values. So, are they going to help? This was a, among the questions that burdened them. Yeah? Okay, but then uh, modern scholars... A very reductionist approach like if you study religion from the perspective of sociology then that would be your approaches yeah so religion and say for example a human social institution not religion as a revelation so because of this shift from understanding religion as revelation to social institution that have made later theologians got trapped because religion as human social institution means that it, it is the religion that is made by man not, not revealed by God yeah? so religion made by man you have men from different parts of the world, different cultures different belief system who actually um teach them that belief system. It's not from revelation. It's from their own thinking. It's from their own experience. So religion is no longer revealed, no longer heavenly inspiration or guidance, but 
merely human responses, human understanding and human interpretation. So no wonder there are so many ideas about God because human religion or religious is very much of their own interpretation. You see, so modern sciences started to gradually understand religion as simply human activities. It's not God revealed. If it is God revealed, then human interpret it and human interpret it according to what they are familiar with, according to their capacity of thinking, of reasoning. So my capacity of reasoning and your capacity of reasoning is very much shaped by your background. That makes you into these different ideas about God. And secondly, because of globalization. Globalization was a term introduced in late 20th century. Late 20th century, you see. But then globalization has made people more aware of plurality than before. Well, maybe uh, in the 19th century, yeah, um, scholars of religions were among the first people who uh, were aware of the manliness of religion. But globalization has opened up this region not only to the scholars, but as well as to the public. So religious prism seems to be very interesting philosophy that makes sense to the public out there. Why there are many religions. And as you can see, it that that's why religious prism become easily accepted by the global community because it helps them to understand this diverse phenomenon. Um, and you have uh, Hans Kung. Hans Kung was very instrumental in um, the Second Vatican Council. Uh, but he was rejected by the Catholic Church later on because he challenged the Catholic uh, doctrine of the infallibility of the Pope. Yeah. But uh, Hans Kung uh, did not move from his position as an inclusivist or religious inclusivist. He was aware of the global community, the different religions, and he put forward the idea of inclusivism even up to now. Yeah. Um, and uh, especially this uh, uh, idea about global community, global religion, uh, sorry, many religions around the globe uh, have been sensed uh, since 1993 in the Parliament World of Religions, even until today, Parliament of World, Parliament of world Religions acknowledge the different religions in the world uh, and, uh, you know, propagate the idea of universal religion and all religions are the same and simply the uh, different path to the same truth, yeah. And um, you know, people started to talk about global ethic because this is one of the in thing, the trendy thing since uh, hence uh, propagation of it, yeah. Uh, so people believe that all religions teach the same values. So the word global ethics become the uh, the word of today. Everybody talks about common values that all religion teach. Um, and there were also many other scholars, Christian scholars, especially that make uh, a review, examination from within Christianity. For example, you see Charles Tetch. Uh, um, you know, a liberal theologian, yeah, uh, started to review the position of Christianity uh, among other religions because in the past, the Catholic, the Christians in general believe that Christianity is superior religion above all other religions, uh, including the inclusivists. They also believe that Christianity is the superior religion. But uh, Trostas say that no, Christianity is just like any other religions. They are the same. Uh, and William Hawkins, for example, uh, say that 
the Catholic, the Christian should review why they need to do missionary because other regions are also teaching good values. So perhaps it's challenging the Christians whether they should pursue with um, missionary or not. Uh, and of course, Toyn B, who does it not? Toyn B, a historian approach to religion, started to uh, review the position of Christianity next to the world religions. And uh, these two important scholars or theologians, la, I regard, was, were very instrumental in propagating religious pluralism. We are going to discuss them uh, more thoroughly in our next lecture. Yeah, Wilfred Cantwell Smith and John Hick. Yeah? Because Wilfred Cantwell Smith made a very significant uh, breakthrough in the way the Christians, in the way modern scholars understand religion. Yeah? Uh, and challenge the way Christianity was made to understood to the Christians. And the same goes to John Hick when he uh, made a, a revolutionary approach in the understanding of Christianity. So I think, uh, you know, I have given you a very quick, brief uh, uh, chronological development on how the Christians from uh, 3 to 5 CE, you know, uh, straight away to 1965 and, you know, uh, up to the present time. How this develop, development from exclusivism, religious exclusivism to religious inclusivism to religious pluralism uh, that, uh, you know, uh, changed the landscape, uh, the theological landscape of Christianity. Uh, of today. Um, so um, I think that's about it. I hope I am able to, uh, you know, make sense to you why religious pluralism uh, was introduced in Christianity uh, and why it has become a um, so-called global philosophy of today, even though it was uh, introduced from within Christianity, but has been, you know, globally accepted today. All right. Whether this acceptance is uh, acceptable or not, <laughs> uh, reasonable or not, that we are going to discuss later on. But enough uh, at this point of time for you to understand. Uh, where this concept of religious wisdom or philosophy of religious wisdom emerged and why it emerged. So, okay, dear students, inshallah, I hope uh, we can see again in the next PowerPoint slides. And inshallah, if you have questions, please do not hesitate. We are going to discuss it during our face-to-face -face consultation or, you know, virtual consult consultation, synchronous consultations. So, inshallah, till we meet again, uh, stay safe, uh, wear a mask wherever you go. Uh, if you go to a uh, you know, crowded place and don't forget to wash your hands. Take care. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.